রাখছে অরুণ মাসি ওয়েলকাম জয়নিং দিস সেশন Oh, nice. And Dr. Maski, do you know Dr. Asan? No, sir. Maski is not in us, sir. No. Hafiz actually is the professor of uh, medicine and uh, chief of uh, cardiac catheterization at University of Nevada and also the governor of American Cardi- College of Cardiology Nevada chapter. These are the only two introductions that I can give. There are a bunch of others. Okay. And, a true and, true, and, a, and a true and true Bangladeshi. Uh, and he was described by one of my friend as the foot soldier general uh, that means he works and he is also the commander uh, of his troop so i have one uh, ecg which uh, if you give me your email i would be sending please uh, i send that ecg to wadu very interesting case sure uh, sinus bradycardia So what I will do is, uh, yeah. if you could email me and um, Atahar, uh, you can, or you can send it to me by, by a WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. Maski. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I plan to, yeah, I plan to discuss next week. Uh, very interesting. And his findings are very good. So, Assalamualaikum. <laughs> সেটাই তো বলছি
আমরা কি স্টার্ট করব ফিরোজ তুমি ই করো ইন্ট্রোডিউস করো আমি আপনাকে দিব আপনি খালিকুজ্জামান ভাইটা খালিকুজ্জামান শুভ্র সবাইকে মিট করে দিও ওকে স্যার শুড স্টার্ট স্যার আমরা লাইভে যাচ্ছি স্যার এখন কথা বলা শুরু করুন শুরু করব স্যার গুড ইভিনিং লেডিজ এন্ড জেন্টলম্যান ওয়েলকাম ইউ অল টু দিস ওয়েবিনার অন ইসিজি বেসিক এন্ড বিয়ন্ড দিস ইজ দি 11th লেকচার অফ দিস সিরিজ and as usual we have got our course directors professor m athar ali and professor abdul wadud choudhury with us we have got two foreign faculty three foreign faculties with us professor uh, dr rofiq ahmed professor uh, ahsan and um, uh, professor orun maske and number of professors and dignity uh, teachers in our panelist including professor mahbubur rahman professor mg azam and professor mohsin hosen our today's lecture will be delivered by dr mohammad khalikul jaman who is the associate professor of cardiology dhaka medical college but before that uh, may i request professor abdul wadud choudhury sir to say few words about today's session and about the our faculties abdul wadud choudhury sir please assalam alaikum and good evening everybody Today our session is about the ECG changes in different metabolic disorders and electrolyte disturbances uh, which is commonly found in different situations both 
in hospital and out hospital in our chambers as well as uh, in critical care setting. Now, today we are going to hear the lecture from Dr. Khalikud Jaman. He is a super professor in my institute and I'm a fan of his. You will find out why. I won't elaborate on it. He is very elaborate, deceptively simple, but he is very knowledgeable and thorough person. You will uh, be amazed about his uh, depth of knowledge. Today we are lucky enough that we have uh, uh, Rafik Sar is our uh, mentor. He is always with us. And he is a uh, USA based epicardiologist, but to us, he is the founder of electrophysiology service of this country. And also we have uh, Professor Chaudhary Hafiz Hassan. He is the top of his class in Dhaka Medical College. He is a bright star. We have grown up when we were students, uh, listening to their reputation and wanting to be like them. At present, uh, he is Cardiology Fellowship Director and Head of Department, University Medical Center, Las Vegas, Nevada. And also, he is currently Governor of American College of Cardiology, Nevada Chapter. And he, we have recently, he has published a book for the COVID-19 frontline doctors named COVID-19 Companion Handbook, a case-based approach. It's a very nice book. You'll be amazed about the diversity of the cases that has been presented in that book. Uh, we have also my friend, Professor Arun Maski from Nepal and from the country, we have cardiologists, internal medicine specialist, critical care medicine specialist, and uh, sometimes I think Professor Khulur Rahman, he doesn't show up, but he was chief of anesthesiology in uh, National Heart Foundation, join us. We are lucky enough to have all of them here. Uh, with that much ado, now I am asking Professor uh, Khalikud Jaman to start his lecture. Uh, may I go to slide share? Yes, you can go, sir. Uh, before going uh, my uh, lecture, uh, starting the lecture, I must uh, wants to express my gratitude for a great introduction from the part of the Professor Abdul Wadi Choudhury. Uh, very good night and salam alaikum to everybody who are joining here. The course director, Professor M. Atahar Ali, Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, Dr. Rofiq Ahmed Sar, and Choudhury Rizul Hassan from USA, and uh, other uh, foreign guests and the panelists, and the, uh, the panelists from countries as well. It is my great, indeed, it is my great pleasure, as well as a great endeavor, you may think about that, that I'm going to present my today's presentation or speech in front of those cardiologists and the electrophysiologists like Dr. Rafiq Ahmed, Chaudhary Hafizul Hassan, Mathahari and Professor Abdul Wadud Chaudhary. So let us start our talk about the ECG in electrolytes and metabolic disorders. And uh, Professor Atahali sir lastly told that may I add something about thermal changes in ECG and also, the ECG in pulmonary disorders, if we get enough time after the discussion of the electrolyte disorders. So, before going to discussion, what is an electrolyte? Electrolytes are the minerals found in the body fluid that carry an electrical charge and are essential in keeping the heart, nerves, and the muscle functioning properly. As such, it is important to maintain a precise and a constant balance of the electrolytes for its proper functioning. So what are the function of the electrolytes? It maintain the fluid osmolality. It is concerned mainly with the resting membrane potential and the action potential. It is very much essential for cardiac activity to go with normally. And concerned with neuromuscular excitability and the tissue function. Some specific function of certain uh, uh, electrolytes are there, like calcium is responsible for coagulation and the bone mineralization. 
buffering activity offered by the bicarbonate and the phosphate and is cofactor of certain enzymes uh, like magnesium calcium zinc these are acting as a cofactor although these are not participating directly in the membrane potential but through indirectly by modulating the factor functions of different coenzymes and the cofactors they are act they are participating in maintaining the membrane potential so in terms of uh, the electrolytes which are very much vital for the heart are potassium calcium and magnesium and these electrolyte imbalances can produce the cardiac arrhythmias ecg is a tool which can detect as well as estimate the severity of the electrolyte imbalances and can judge whether there is any risk of serious arrhythmia or not and there is a correlation sometimes or sometimes may not have correlation between the severity of the electrolyte imbalances and the visible ecg changes so going into details about the electrolyte disorders uh, uh, producing ecg changes we must have to we have to recapitulate for uh, our knowledge about the action potential of the cardiac muscle cells particularly for the students here we have five phases of the cardiac action potential uh, in cardiac muscle cells and conducting system the sinus node it is not as like as this muscle cells the polarization which is uh, mainly responsible for sudden in rush of the sodium followed by early repolarization that is for opening of the i2 channel for the potassium to go out and the plateau phase maintaining the at the same time there is influx influx of the potassium out of the cell to the uh, extracellular fluid during phase 3 phase and the phase 4 is maintaining predominantly by the potassium and next you can see the action potential of the sl node differs uh, substantially from the action potential of the muscle of the atrial as well as ventricular muscles that it lacks the phase 1 phase 2 as well as phase 4 of the action potential uh, phase 0 correlates with the qrs complex with the uh, action potential phase 1 the repolarization phase 2 3 are the repolarization wave that is uh, this is repolarization sorry to uh, this it will be phase 2 will be repolarization as well phase 1 corresponds to the j point and the phase 2 st segment phase 3 is t wave corresponds to the t wave and the phase 4 is the resting membrane potential which corresponds to the tq segments of the electrocardiogram so by influencing the action potential of the cardiac muscle cells pacemaker cells and the conducting system of the heart electrolyte can produce disorder or abnormalities in the red yes rhythm many a times p wave in a good number of cases pr interval qr is complex st segments qt interval q wave and u wave either singly or in combination the electrolyte imbalances may produce some impact on these wave intervals and the seg segments of the ecg so let us go first in the potassium because potassium uh, is a vital elements Are the electrolytes which are maintaining all of the part of the repolarization phase, including the resting membrane potential. So you see, the fruits are very much rich in potassium, including the yogurt and the other fruits, fishes, as well as potatoes. The normal range of potassium in our body is, in an adult, 3.5 to 5 milliequivalent per liter. and we call is hyperkalemia when the level exceeds greater than 5 mg equivalent per liter or somehow it is within 5.5 mg equivalent per liter and depending on the level it can be graded as mild moderate and severe we call it severe when it exceeds 7 mg equivalent per liter before going into the ecg changes in hyperkalemia let us have a case scenario an 18 years old female having diabetes hypertension ckd she was on dialysis and he missed dialysis on two occasion develops severe lethargy decreased oral intake and mental confusion and brought to the emergency department ecg and the biochemical test were done the ecg uh, electrolytes show severe hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis ecg shows you see from the tracing that uh, first impression we are uh, seeing here the tall peak t wave there is tenting effect of the t wave uh you are seeing that there is slight broadening of the qrs complex here 
and PO wave are seen, and there is first degree heart block. There is slight prolongation of the PR interval, and there is axis a bit towards the left. That is left axis deviation. So here the changes are tall peak T wave, tenting of the T wave, slight broadening of the QRS complex, and there is prolongation of the PR interval. And this patient after admission shows a brief period of sine wave. Here you see. Uh, from broad QRS complex, and it is going to much broader. This is sinoventricular rhythm, we'll see later on. Then ultimately, it turns into a sine wave, that is at up, up, up turn and the down turn. With empirical treatment with calcium, insulin dextrose, patient shows uh, there is much normalization of the previous changes, particularly concerning the QRS complex a bit uh, as smaller in the uh, shorter in duration but TOF still remain uh, a bit picking TOF still remain picking but there is shorter peer intervals and disappearance of the sine wave after uh, dialysis there is complete resolution of the hyperkalemic all the changes uh, although there is some hypertrophic changes is there but TOF is getting smaller and it is of normal amplitude Next case is 72 years old male, male suffering from heart failure, hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus on enalapril for hypertension, spironolactone, and metoprolol for heart failure. So we know that the patient uh, uh, getting enalapril can produce hyperkalemia, spironolactone can produce hyperkalemia. These are two commonly used drugs. And ABG shows potassium was 9 millimole per liter, and the patient blood sugar was 32 millimole per liter. Patient was diagnosed as a case of diabetic ketocidosis and hyperkalemia. You see the ECG that the uh, important changes are the tall T waves along with very broad QRS complexes with absence of the P wave here. So there is broadening of the QRS complex, absence of the P wave, and there is tall T waves. A 70 years old male getting chemotherapy for non hodgkins lymphoma present to the emergency department with multiple joint pain and swelling and giddiness and twist in both. He is also having the difficulty in breathing. First ECG shows there is no POI. It appears that in the case of junction of rhythm, but striking thing is that there is the Eiffel Tower effect of the TOF. That is TOF getting larger and deep is more pointed and the base is relatively narrow. Uh, and a bit widening of the QRS complex. The second ECG after a few minutes, it shows severe junctional bradycardia. So considering all the facts, they are thinking about doing temporary pacemaker, considering it's the case of six sinus syndrome. But at the same time, they are doing the investigation and the reports come. <coughs> Potassium shows 7.9 millimeter per uh, equivalent per liter, creatinine in three milligram, it is 12 milligram per DL. So it was a diagnosis of tumor lysis syndrome resulting in massive tissue breakdown and hyperkalemia. And after normalization of the potassium, you see the almost all the uh, the uh, money, the changes gone up except the pointed T waves. Now uh, uh, we have seen a range of ECG findings is there. I'm not going into details, but the striking findings. What are the striking findings in case of hyperkalemia? These are the tall peak T wave and the T wave peaking persists and worsens with increasing hyperkalemia. There is shortening of the QT interval. And QRS will gradually get wider, PUI will be broad, and eventually PUI will disappear, resulting in sign of ventricular rhythm. The QRS will be wider further, and the S wave continues into the T wave, resulting in sine wave curve. And ultimately, when the potassium gets more and more, more than 8, 9, or 10 milli equivalent per liter, patient may develop cardiac arrest, resulting from ventricular asystole or fibrillation. It again, by seeing the ECG, we can have a knowledge about the biochemical level of the serum potassium. When we are seeing only changes is in the T wave and PR segment to some extent P wave, then we have an assessment the patient has got mild hyperkalemia. When there is broadening of the QRS complex and there is involvement of the ST segment in the form of shortening or elevation, and there is loss of POF, then we have to think about patient pro up, they have moderate hyperkalemia. But find the patient progressive widening of the QRS complex resulting in bundle branch blocks, 
resulting in sinew wave and ventricular fibrillation, then it is almost certain that we are dealing with the case of severe hyperkalemia. So this is a, a big one picture which can depict all the things at a time. That's when the potassium level ranges in between five to six, we are observing that the T waves is peaking. When it is in between six to seven, yes, there is change in the P wave is gradually smaller and it will disappear ultimately. When it ranges between seven to eight, widening of the Q wave complex will be started. And when it's more than eight, you see that there is sine wave pattern and ultimately leads to development of ventricular fibrillation and cardiac assisted and death. So how these all the things are happening inside? These are the some in short the electrophysiological mechanism of how the increased potassium may produce all the changes. It affects the phase zero, phase two, and phase three of the action potential phases. And the extra cellular potassium rises. The ratio between the intracellular and extracellular potassium is decreased, and the resting membrane potential becomes less negative. So this will affect the height and velocity of the phase zero of the action potential. So there will be slowing of the conduction velocity, the atria ventricle, and will cause widening of the PUI and PUI complex. When it affects the phase two, there will be faster and shortening phase two, which is equivalent to plateau phase, resulting in shortening of the ST segment and shorter QT interval. In phase three, there is rapid and shorter repolarization because in presence of hyperkalemia, there is conductance of the potassium across the cell membrane increase so more potassium will be fluxed out. So there will be shortening and steepening, uh, steeper downslope of the action potential curve here, resulting in peaking of the Q, T wave. The hyperkalemia affects cardiac transmembrane action potential differently. You see the scale here, the potassium sensitivity to atrial muscle, ventricular muscle, AV ventricle, and AC node are not the same. The sensitivity is mostly in the atrial muscle, second ventricular muscle, and the least resistant is SNO. And we'll see the, how they affect the conduction system and the rhythms of the heart later on. So the special attention will be uh, in case of hyperkalemia, the special changes are tall peaking T-wave, sinoventricular rhythm, sine wave, and the pseudo infarction pattern resulting from ST elevation in V1 and V2. So what is tall peak T-wave? We all know peaking of the T-wave is the earliest to occur and worsen with increasing hyperkalemia, often described as tenting because they closely resemble the shape of a tent. They are tall and symmetrical, tallest in the precordial leaves. They have got pointed tip. That's why they are called as uh, Eiffel Tower effect on the T-wave. Narrow base definitely, steep ascent and descent is there. And the TFs are open taller than of the QRS complex in the precordial leaves. The diagnosis of hyperkalemia basically is unthinkable or untenable unless there is any T wave change. The T wave has got a multiple causes of uh, the peaking of the uh, T wave, among which hyperacute myocardial infarction may induce some T wave changes in hyperkalemia, definitely, and the normal variant also may have. Some cases there may be uh, also T wave, uh, large T wave or picking of the T wave. This is a bit uh, at a glance, there are differences between the two. Most important thing one is that the base is narrow and the apex is pointed or tip is pointed, whereas in hyperacute, all it has got a broad base but the blunted apex. At the same time, there should have some evolutionary change and also some change in the R wave, particularly when it is associated with acute migraine infarction. There will be associated change with the R wave and also QT interval, which is prolonged in case of hyperacute migraine infarction. Second important change is sinoventricular rhythm for the students to know about that. You see the ECG tracing, why you will not find any P wave? No P wave here. The QRS complexes are very much broad and the rate is very slow. So what is sinoventricular rhythm? The absence of P waves in hyperkalemia, even when the rhythm remains normal sinus, is called the sinoventricular rhythm. What does it imply? It implies preserved sinus node function with conduction of the impulses to the AV junction without generalized atrial excitation, which I previously told that the atrial muscles are very sensitive to the hyperkalemic changes. So in this phase, 
sinus node is active it is producing impulse but atria remain paralyzed so there will be no p wave generation the impulse propagation in such cases is presumably via the specialized internodal tract so it passes through the specialized internodal tract to the junctional tissue and to the ventricular tissue so there is ventricular complexes but there is no pure so it is called sinoventricular rhythm you see here when the qrs complexes are no longer preceded by pure then the rhythm is impossible to differentiate from ab junctional rhythm here you see these complexes are narrow and there is no pure and at a first glance we have to tell it that the patient has got junctional rhythm at the same time picking of the tear is there to explain hyperkalemic changes on the other hand when the complexes are broad then it will be very much difficult to differentiate it from accelerated idioventricular rhythm then sine wave what is sine sine is basically a mathematical curve it has got a up slope and a down slope just like a line which is going up and going down uh, the characteristics of the sine waves are when there is extreme wide more than 0.20 second and basically it is produced due to merging of the s wave of the qrs complex with the t wave resulting in a single line complete loss of visible atrial activity on the ecg what does it, it depicts or what does it indicate it indicates worsening cardiac conduction delay from hyperkalemia and it occurs when the potassium level goes to extreme level more than 8 mini equivalent per liter the first one is sinoventricular rhythm is it tracing and second one again is is tracing of the sine wave hyperkalemia sometimes may produce st segment elevation particularly in the right sided chest cavity but may be in inferior list also it is so striking that it raises the possibility of coexist an acute myocardial infarction as well so sometimes it is very difficult and sometimes patient need to have emergency coronary angiogram to exclude the possibility of acute coronary syndrome the how it is produced mechanism is unclear but probably the shortening of the phase 2 of the repolarization phase producing shortening of the st segment and at the same time there is peaking of the t wave so the t wave is gradually gets thicker and thicker and it try to pull the st segment up as well as the qrs uh, later part of the qrs complex to pull it up so it looks like is elevation basically it is due to hyperkalemic changes so you see the ecg here there is anteroceptal simulating the anteroceptal myocardial infarction and hyperkalemic patient after correction of the potassium you see there is almost normalization of the st segment in the v1 this is simulating this is very much classical simulating acute inferior mi because you are observing that in the ecg there is in lead 3 and lead avf there is st elevation and on the other side there is reciprocal st depression in the 1 and avf which raises the strong possibility and doubt of inferior myocardial infarction on the same time there is st elevation in the v1 and the depression in the v2 and v3 so there is strong doubt but this patient is suffering from edison's disease important cause of hyperkalemia he has got dyslipidemia getting high dose statin therapy develop probably rhabdomyolysis ultimately leading to severe hyperkalemia and the stt wave changes and after correction of the hyperkalemia uh, of not correction but after giving the intravenous calcium administration the st st changes disappears although the potassium still remains high and rarely in hyperkalemia in certain cases may lead to changes simulating the brugada syndrome you see in the v1 and v2 there is a right bundle branch block pattern of the changes in v1 and v2 st elevation 2 mm or more and the t of inversion these changes sometimes may occur in hyperkalemia so all these are changes due to hyperkalemia now we'll go to Uh, to hypokalemia what is hypokalemia when potassium level goes below down 3.5 mL per liter in again three times mild moderate and severe severe we call when less than 2.5 and the ecg changes uh, usually does not occur until it goes below 2.7 mL per liter the ecg changes does not normally correlate oil with plasma concentration as it occurs in hyperkalemia and is an unreliable guide in guide in the diagnosis of the hypokalemia 
young men of 22 years presented with the features of acute gastroenteritis with hypovolemic shock and extreme muscular weakness. And along with other biochemical tests, ECG has been done. It shows, it shows that ST depression is very much marked here with T inversion and the prominence of the UF here. At the same time, there is long QV or long QT interval. A patient chronic diarrhea with weight loss and anemia who is suffering from the villus of the, of the colon, one of the important uh, intestinal colonic disorder that is responsible for uh, potassium losing gastroenteropathy. This patient's ECG before doing the colonoscopy reveals that the patient has got UOF inversion with appearance and prominence of the UOF in certain leads with long QT or long Q interval, and the patient has potassium level 1.9 millimole per liter. And the patient who is getting suffering from DCM with congestive heart failure, having loop diuretic for a long period over the last five years, developed extreme weakness and lethargy because the loop diuretics is one of the important drugs which is responsible for hypokalemia. You see there is prolongation of the QT interval and uh, atrial ectopics causing R on T phenomena predisposed to development of the trot series D point. So what are the ECG changes in hypokalemia? There is a lot of ECG changes, but the vital one or striking changes are affecting the P wave, affecting the T wave, affecting the U wave and the ST wave. You see, there is increased amplitude and width of the P wave, prolongation of the PR interval, there may be ST depression, U wave will gradually smaller, become flat or even become inverted, and there will be appearance of the U wave and U wave will gradually gets larger and larger. And ultimately, with worsening hypokalemia, there will be supraventricular and ventricular ectopics and tachyarrhythmias ultimately leading to life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. So in a picture, you can see that in decreasing potassium level in a patient with hypokalemia, UIF strains become inverted, UIF appears and will grow further. There will be fusion of the two waves and there will be prolongation of the QT or QU interval. Same thing you are seeing according to level of the potassium. So interesting thing is that how the potassium deals with the T wave. It is called pull and push effect. And the potassium level rises, that is in cases of hyperkalemia, potassium tries to pull the P wave, producing peaking of the P wave. On the other hand, contrary, the potash, less potassium or hypokalemia will push the T wave, goes to baseline, become flat, and ultimately it may become inverted. This is called the pull and push effects of the potassium on the T wave. How it affects the action potential? So it is just uh, contrary to the uh, affection of the hyperkalemia, but slope of the phase two action potential here increases. There, this is responsible for prolonged QT interval. Phase three of the transmembrane action potential deviation decelerate and become less steep, resulting in low amplitude T wave. So hypokalemia in different OS is uh, gives rise to development of rent and tachyarrhythmias. You show the different mechanism. I, I will not go in details. Hypokalemia affects the sodium potassium pump. When there is less potassium, there is decreased activity of the sodium potassium pump. That will activate the more sodium calcium exchange, calcium overload delayed after depolarization. Hypokalemia, when there is potassium less, there is conductance across the cell membrane of the potassium will be decreased that will prolong the repolarization phase. So early after depolarization uh, will be produced. So there will be more chance of development of arrhythmia triggering. So hypokalemia in various ways can produce reentrant tachyarrhythmias. In hypokalemia, our special attention about the U wave as because the U wave which are produced in hypokalemia is larger and is large amplitude. So genesis of the UA, uh, does it differ from normal person? In a normal person, what is the uh, exact, what are the hypotheses? There is no uh, exact reason for origin uh, of the UA in a normal person, but there are ma three main hypotheses. 
most popular one is that it is produced because of the late repolarization of the his parking system late repolarization of some portions or cells of the left ventricle either septum or from papillary muscle but the most accepted one is that the delayed after depolarization of the ventricular wall occurring during early rapid ventricular freezing phase that is called the electrical diastole that stresses the myocardium and produces some after depolarization that is the mostly accepted hypothesis behind the genesis of the e-wave in a normal person but how it is produced in how it differs from hypokalemic e wave in hypokalemia there are two opinion regarding the origin of the large e wave one is splitting opinion and another is fusion opinion splitting opinion is that it has been shown that the hyperkalemia the normal t waves become interrupted and split into two components and the t waves represent the first component and the e wave the second component and another opinion is fusion opinion the t wave regresses u wave grows old grow larger and there is fusion of the two complexes resulting in a large u wave uh, in the previous uh, slide we have seen the behind the genesis of the u wave normally it is the uh, the most popular one is that the delayed repolarization of the his parking system is responsible for u wave but here there is most popular hypothesis is that there is delayed repolarization of the myocardial lm cells that is mid myocardial cells which also shows delayed repolarization rather than this part in the system because the large e wave uh, these are very large e wave in hypokalemia this part in the system contain a small amount of mass so that mass during repolarization they unusual to give uh, so large deflection in the ecg tracing so it is the mid myocardial m cells repolarization delayed repolarization which is responsible for production of the e wave in the hypokalemia so it is not usual e wave that is occurring in hypokalemia although the e wave are the most common ecg abnormalities in hypokalemia but it is not at all specific in all it may happen in bradycardia lvh mitral valve prolapse hyperthyroidism even some drugs may produce hypokalemia now let us go to calcium level calcium is very important cation inside the body although it remains in the bones muscles in the circulation on the 1% remain in the circulation so normal calcium level is 2.1 to 2.6 mmol per liter we call it hypercalcemia when it exceeds 2.6 mmol per liter i am talking about the total calcium not ionized calcium and the ionized calcium is mainly responsible for the Uh, membrane potentials and other things not the total calcium and largely the calcium concentration largely depends on the serum albumin level that will be uh, calculated after correction of the albumin level a patient suffering from hypervitaminosis d develop due to overdosing of the vitamin d develops hypercalcemia because in the covid era there is increased tendency to take vitamin d in a large dose covid has been in our country for the last 6 months so large dose vitamin d can produce hypervitaminosis d we should be care about that so hypervitaminosis d is one of the cause of hypercalcemia and you see the ecg changes while you see the appearance of there is flooding of the down slope of the qrs complex which is we are calling is j wave osborne wave or j wave prominence j wave next the patient suffering from bronchogenic carcinoma has hypercalcemia as because of paraneoplastic nature of the tumor as well as secondary metastasis to the bone can produce hypercalcemia the hypercalcemia here you see there is shortening of the qt interval and there is very striking change in the uh, down deflection of the qrs complex which we have called is prominent j wave as well as short qt interval this patient is suffering from parathyroid adenoma secreting large volume of parathyroid hormone into the circulation which goes to the uh, heart and produces so bizarre changes qrs complexes are bored and here you see the uh, see the j wave here on the particular in the p1 and the qrs complexes you see is very short A patient suffering from sarcoidosis with hy systemic hypertension, getting hydrochlorothiazide for the more than five years. Sarcoidosis is one of the important cause of hypercalcemia, and on the other hand, hydrochlorothiazide produces the same tension and hypercalcemia. 
So you see the broad-based uh, T wave as well as there is appearance of the J wave here. So there are, there are a lot of changes affecting many of the uh, waves and the intervals, but the important one is there will be shortening of the ST segment and there will be shortening of the QT interval. At the same time, there will be prominence of the J wave. And if we look at the T wave, there will be a bit flattening and widening of the T wave. Prolonged PR interval and widening of the QS complex is also an important feature. And ultimately, in certain cases, there may be elevation of the ST segment in the anteroceptor lead, giving rise to again confusion about the acute myocardial infarction. What is the basic cause? We see from the action potential uh, curve that the calcium has got role only in the phase two of the repolarization phase. So here, there will be shortening of the phase two of the action potential, resulting in shortening of the QT interval. So what are the special changes here? Osborne waves and pseudo infarction pattern. What is that Osborne wave? We are uh, in a short, this is the J point. And this is the J point. It is more prominent when the J point become more prominent, giving us to wave, then it is called J wave. This is the J wave. And these are the J point, which are prominent points. How it is produced? It is a, uh, it is a deflection with a dome or a hump configuration occurring at the RST junction on the ECG. It is pronounced in anterolateral and inferior leaves. J wave is also known as the Osborne wave, late delta wave, K wave, H wave, or hypothermic wave because it is classically described scientifically in hypothermia. In the setting of hypothermia, this phenomenon is thought to be most specific. It is not only found in hypercalcemia, but also found in hypothermia, benign early repolarization syndrome, Brogara syndrome, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, and active pericarditis. This is the eponymous history of the Osborne wave. We are not going, going in details about that, but although the Osborne wave has been named uh, after the Osborne, who studies the effect on hypothermia, and he described this as a deflection of the current of the injury due to produce due to current of injury. But first, it was described by cross in a patient with hypercalcemic conditions. But due to systemic and scientific way of research, the wave has been named against the Osborne. But in 1996, Ian and Angel Hitch provided the best explanation for production or pathogenesis of electrophysiology of the uh, Osborne wave. He described that the transient outward current mediated spike and dome morphology of the action potential across the ventricular wall underlies the manifestation of the electrophysiographic J wave. And the presence of a prominent action potential not in the epicardium and not in the endocardium is shown to provide a voltage gradient that manifests as J wave or an elevated J point in the ECG. You see in this picture, the epicardial, endocardial, and the myocardial potential differs. And the, it is the epicardial region where there is marked notching of the action potential uh, notch. And this produces transmural voltage gradient, which is responsible for producing a J wave in the ECG, J wave deflection in the ECG. You see a patient with hypercalcemia having anteroceptal, uh, in anteroceptal leads, there is marked elevation of the ST segment in V2, V3, even in V4. Even. After normalization of the calcium level, you see there is ST uh, comes down to its normal isoelectric point. It is hypothesized that how the, in hypercalcemia, there is ST elevation. It's hypothesized that the short ST segment of QT interval, short QT interval causes the T waves to be pulled at the end of the QRS complex and the initial upslope of the T wave causing the appearance of the ST segment elevation. So here the possibility, uh, possibilities or explanation for ST elevation is that the hypercalcemic shortening of the ST segment pull the T wave closer to the QRS complex and the ascending limb of the T wave is mimicking the change of the ST segment elevation in anteroceptor leaves. Other possibilities are there. Uh, you see the other possibilities. I'm not voting there. I'm going to hypercalcemic changes and as well as uh, hyperkalemic changes. You see in the hyperkalemic changes, T wave is grows and it is peak and peak, peaker, become peaker and peaker 
at the same time there is shortening the qt and it's pulling the st sec pulling the qrs complex with it so it is producing st elevation in hypercalcemia you see the qrs complex as if it is pulling the tyf closer to it so the ascending of the, the qrs ascending limb of the tyf may produce some false impression about the st elevation and what is hypocalcemia when serum calcium falls down below 2.1 millimol per liter then we call is hypocalcemia and the hypocalcemia usually produces remarkable change on the st segment the patient with hypothyroid parathyroidism having st uh, prolonged qt interval of about 500 millisecond this patient has got acute pancreatitis leading to hypocalcemia and here is also prolonged qt interval the patient has got malabsorption resulting from cones affection of the small intestine ultimately leading to hypovitaminosis d you see here the classical changes narrowing of the abit narrowing slight narrowing of the qrs complex uh, reduced pr interval toi flattening somewhere it is inverted and there is appearance of the e wave somewhere and somehow it is prominent and the prolongation of the st segments a lot of changes in hypocalcemia but the pronounced effect is on the qt interval which makes it elongates it and resulting in flattening of the st segment and prolonged qt interval t wave there may be inversion of the t wave or maybe a slight reduction in the amplitude of the t wave and the ab blocks is an important feature of the hypocalcemia joint so how it is produced prolongation of the phase 2 of the action potential as if the calcium influx is mainly responsible for this plateau phase so this prolongation of the phase 2 of the action potential causing lengthening of the st segment here so this is a very interesting slide this slide the picture itself depicts the important changes resulting from hyper or hypokalemia resulting from hyper or hypocalcemia you see here the when there is potassium is increasing it pulls the t wave up so important feature is peaking of the t wave and when the potassium rises it pushes the t it is producing uh, flattening of the t wave even inversion of the when the calcium level increases it pull the t wave closer to the qrs complex and when the calcium level decreases it push the t wave uh, away from the qrs complex producing long qt interval now we shift to magnesium level magnesium although it has got no direct effect on the action potential but it maintains uh, it is uh, modulating the modulating the activities of the different enzymes acts as a cofactors for different enzyme systems of the body that helps in transport of the sodium potassium and calcium normal magnesium level is 0.75 to 1 millimol per liter and the critical value we tell it less than 0.5 millimol and more than 3.3 .3 millimol per liter but important change uh, what is that it is often associated with other electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia and hypocalcemia often it confound tcg changes so sometimes it may be very much difficult to differentiate between the changes of hypomagnesemia hypokalemia because the changes are almost similar and they are coexisting in the same patient at the same time so what are the important changes you see there will be prolongation of the qt interval here as well as pr prolongation and widening of the qrs complex to some extent st depression t wave may be inverted or low amplitude and in, what is striking is that there may be precipitation of the supraventricular and ventricular tech arrhythmias so you see the pathogenesis how the magnesium is producing its effect on the cardiac uh, rhythm disturbances hypomagnesemia intracellular magnesium depletion who is produces disturbances in the activity of the sodium potassium exchange system by atps uh, disturbance in the atps system so reduced intracellular potassium increased risk of cardiac arrhythmia and for the same reason there is inability of the kidney to retain potassium to hypokalemia and there is increased risk of the cardiac arrhythmias ultimately may lead to sudden death of this patient at the same time magnesium has got some action on the coronary artery tone sometimes hypomagnesium may produce coronary vasoconstriction as well as some uh, some uh, some postulates that magnesium is an initiating factor sometimes may play a role in the 
progression of the coronary atherosclerosis. The malabsorption is one of the cause and the proton pump inhibitor in the person or the patient taking proton pump inhibitor for a long period, they may also suffer from hypomagnesium. So you see the ECG at real fibrillation with five ventricular rate and there is normalization of this rhythm after correction of the magnesium. Second, you see that there is patient is suffering from carcinoma of the stomach with gastrocolic fistula. Inside fistula is an important cause of hypomagnesemia and patient is on nasogastric suction. That is any, another precipitating factor for hypomagnesemia and total parental and nutrition patient is on total parental nutrition that all the things in combined leads to development of hypomagnesemia, which is causing the long QT interval of 5-10 seconds, which ultimately succumb, which ultimately turns into prostate repointes. So hypomagnesemia affects the sodium potassium uh, ATPS system. I, I have already told, I will not take any time, more time here. Hypermagnesemia is a very rare occurrence. Uh, isolated hypermagnesemia is very rare. We called it mild when more than one, called it severe when more than 2.8. Magnesium usually produces a depression over the conduction system of the conduction system of the heart, producing first degree AV block, broadening of the QRS, and prolongation of the QT interval here. But important change is that it is maintaining T wave upright, and there may be peaking of the T wave as well as like as hyperkalemia. So it is very striking change because the changes in hypomagnesemia and hypermagnesemia is more or less same except the T wave change. Hypermagnesemia is a very rare occurrence and it is possible in case of chronic kidney disease. This patient is suffering from uh, steroid resistant focal segment of glomerulosclerosis resulting in the end stage renal disease is on cyclical continuous peritoneal dialysis and uh, the first ECG shows that there is tall T waves, broadening of the QRS complexes and somewhere there is missing of the ventricular impulses, uh, atrial impulses to go down to the ventricles. Irregular conduction with escape bits and after normalization of the magnesium by emergent dialysis, you see these changes disappears, but there are certain changes affecting the ST segment and the T wave here. Hypothyroids are more susceptible to develop hypermagnesemia as well as those patients who are getting lithium therapy, as well as those patients getting magnesium containing cathartics or laxatives. This patient has got hypermagnesemia with prolonged QT interval. Now sodium, all the sodium is very abundant in our body in the extracellular fluid but its affection to the action potential is less. Increased or decreased sodium levels do not have any impact on the ECG, nor cardiac rhythm, nor on the impulse conduction. However, there are a few case reports. What are those? These are case reports, hyponatremia presenting as a conduction, cardiac conduction defect. You see the patient presenting with complete heart block, suffering from severe hyponatremia. How is affects? How hyponatremia affects this? It is due to the fact that the hyponatremia, due to reduction in the level of the sodium, the phase zero phase of the action potential become slower and delayed. That ultimately leads to prolongation of the QRS interval and affection on the conduction system of the heart. In another case report, you see there is wave alternance in a patient with hyponatremia. And suspected hyponatremia in a patient uh, who ultimately leads to development of the Bugada phenocopy type of QRS changes in the right sided chest layers. Now, the extreme hypernatremia is a probable cause of fatal arrhythmia. Why we are telling is extreme? When the sodium level exceeds more than 190, then it is called extreme hypernatremia. There is fatal arrhythmia, you see here the sinus tachycardia, which is ultimately. ST segment depression, prolongation of the QT interval ultimately leads to development of sine wave and patient develop cardiac arrest and death. In extreme hyperkinetremia, you see the sequential ECG changes. When the, when the patient was admitted, the sodium level was 254 millimole per liter and there was sinus tachycardia, shortening of the PR interval, ST depression, T inversion. So, and before discharge of the patient, 
the sodium level was quite corrected it goes down to uh, 140 millimole per liter sinus tachycardia persists and all other changes stt changes and the shortening of the pr interval become normalized so these are the few case reports of hypernatremia but theoretically sodium uh, usually does not produce any electrocardiographic changes before uh, that there is marked changes in the central nervous system and the patient usually succumbs from other disorders rather than the cardiac disorders so at the end this is the conclusive slide in an art shell we are seeing the changes here i am not going in details these are the few important changes which are very essential to memorize for instant diagnosis of the ecg changes of the uh, hypo or hyper kalemia or calcemia or magnesium so with all this this is the last slide of my presentation from electrolyte imbalances i think my time has been finished I have got other slide in extra cardiac disorders like thermal disorders and others. Uh, should I, I think, proceed further uh, or I, I should stop here? Two more sessions after that. Okay. Uh, and uh, Abdul Wadud Choudhury sir, Firoz. should we finish here, sir? No, Firoz, I, I think the, we can arrange another lecture for uh, uh, Khalikuzan. Okay. Sir. And okay. because there is a big chapter pulmonary disease. ICU that is the uh, ECG in the ICU setting. There are some good topics to discuss. Hello, good one. Dr. Kai, I think we will finish here today for Dr. Khalikud Jaman and we will listen to Dr. Khalikud Jaman another day. He has given a beautiful description of all these electrolyte imbalances starting from potassium, calcium and magnesium and also sodium. And then he has given... Uh, in detail, I have detail. never heard. Exactly, sir. He has shown also number of cases where uh, these electrolytes happens and how it is corrected and the ECG was normalized. May I request Dr. Khaliku Jaman to stop sharing his screen and we can go for some question and answer sessions. Uh, we have got we have got few questions on the topic. One of the questions is from uh, Professor Abdul Wadu Choudhury. What is tall T wave? How tall is tall, Dr. Khaliku Jaman? Generally, uh, we in limb leads and the chest leads. And the chest leads are more closer to the chest wall. So here, when the T wave amplitudes exceeds more than 10 millimeter, then we call it tall T. And in the limb leads, when it exceeds more than five millimeter height, then we call it tall T. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Khaliku Jaman. Uh, there are some other questions. Slide share. Um, stop. Slide share. Stop. Yes, uh, slide, slide sharing okay. is, has been uh, okay. stopped. Okay. Uh, how do we diagnose a case of acute anterior mine uh, from hypercalcemia patient? Differentiate between myocardial infarction and hypercalcemia ECG. Hypercalcemia ECG, yes, there is a doubt sometimes when it is associated with ST elevation. ST elevation is not a very much common accompaniment of the hypercalcemia, but when it happens, then we have to differentiate from clinically from the history, ECG exam, and other biochemical tests as well. By seeing the ECG, uh, our today's discussion will be limited on the uh, ECG findings. In hyper, hypercalcemia, there will be shortening of the QT interval and there, T wave, there will be no change. And you will see that the QRS complex, as if the QRS complex is trying to pull the T wave closer to the QRS complex, and the ascending of the T wave is mainly responsible for simulating the infarction pattern in acute hypercalcemia or chronic hypercalcemia. On, on the other hand, in acute migraine infarction, ST elevation is associated with lengthening of the Q, QT interval. And at the same time, there will be change in the T wave. There will be hyperacute T wave changes. And others are evolutionary changes. 
and from the history as well. So ECG will show short QT interval and the T wave will be much prominent in hyperacute myocardial infarction. Thank you, Dr. Khaliku Jaman. Uh, I think we can take some comments from our experts. Uh, may I request Dr. Rufiq Ahmed Saad to say a few words about today's lecture regarding how is it is important about the ECG changes to know the ECG change in electrolyte imbalance. Thank you. This is a wonderful lecture. I mean, the thing is that uh, electrolyte abnormality, we cannot see it when you examine the patient. So our job is when we look at an EKG to suspect it. And then every time I look at an ECG, which I think is hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, or hypocalcemia, I can never be sure. So I will immediately go back and look in the computer to find out the patient's laboratory finding. Uh, and let's say in hyperkalemia, you see these bizarre looking QRS complexes. You have to make sure that the patient is fine and get the ECG. So this is, I think, is a wonderful lecture. And this is ongoing. I think we'll have. I mean, remember one thing that we will never master ECG or as a matter of fact, anything in medicine. I mean, it's an evolving field. We have to continue learning. Uh, I'm sure if I ask, give an ECG to Dr. Khaliku Jaman, Dr. Professor Adud or, or, or our faculty, or sometimes we'll get confused with this. Um, thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have got Professor ATM Khulilu Rahman, sir, which is a professor of Anesthesia. Sir, are you with us? Professor Khalilu Rahman, sir? Yes, I am with you. Sir, uh, sir, can you have some comments on uh, Actually, I joined lately. I listened last uh, uh, five minutes of the lecture, but I believe it was very uh, informative and useful to everybody. And I am a person who deals the arrhythmia every day. This is my profession. Actually, what happens, well, we just, I, I am just outside the operation theater now. I finished two CBG one hour before. And you know, this, this time the CBGs are uh, uh, beating heart surgery. So they handle the heart, the make arrhythmia. We have to uh, treat instantly. So you, uh, we should discuss all those things in another session, uh, definitely. And even, you know, uh, uh, in the morning, we did one aortic valve replacement. And any uh, uh, patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, we have to give some diuretic, mannitol, uh, so uh, to uh, perfuse the kidney and the peripheral circulation like this. So that makes electrolyte imbalance. And we always try to balance that one by repeating the electrolyte test every hour during the surgery. And all my staff and the, even the perfusionist, our, the technologist, they know how to uh, manage this uh, potassium deficiency when it happens. And even uh, what happens today, the patient was hypothermic. And my junior anesthetist, uh, he started the pacing. I don't know why you are doing pacing. The temperature is still 33 degrees. Can come to 36. Then we'll see. I stopped the pacemaker. And after, when the temperature was 36, it was sinus and 90 per minute. So there are a lot of things happening with the heart, with the people uh, they are handling the heart. Is and and uh, to, uh, the, the cardiologist, even the cardiologist and the team. Thank you, sir. Thank Rest you for your. Thank you for your nice uh, opinion. Uh, uh, may just, I request... just one minute more. One minute more. Yes. I, 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 sure, sure. My, my internet is a problem. So what happens, I want to uh, emphasize, even in the world or anywhere in Bangladesh, till now, we are not using the invasive method of uh, gross imba uh, electrolyte imbalance. We are giving in the salines. That is not at all uh, advisable. Well, now the pump and other is do services available and every unit and 
hospital must know how to uh, increase the potassium or decrease the potassium or is the sodium efficient and safe. So uh, I have requested everybody to ventilate all these things. Now things are available. That, uh, the, our juniors must and the nurses staff must understand it. I saw more than 15 patients die due to our uh, fusion of potassium in my Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, may, uh, may I request Professor Chaudhuri Hafizul Hassan uh, to give a brief comment on the subject. Chaudhuri. So I, I actually enjoyed the, uh, the lecture and it was brilliant. Um, but a few practical things uh, that I, I actually mentioned in the question and answer session, uh, but I don't know how much uh, time I have. Uh, but I wanted to share uh, something with you guys. Uh, we, we'll, we'll give you some time after the session of Dr. Rafiq Hamid, sir. Uh, okay. We'll give some time for showing that. Uh, may I request Professor Abdul Wadu Chaudhary, sir? Uh, I promised the audience they, there will be an in-depth lecture. I think my promise is fulfilled. Uh, we really enjoyed it. The most important thing is the underlying cause and mechanism, he has explained that nicely. We know about these changes, but we don't pay too much attention to how it actually occurs. And uh, today's lecture uh, has give us a glimpse of that. Uh, I think we should start uh, Rafiq session, yes. no, session. Can I, and can then- I something? Sir, sir. I think Hafiz has, I talked to Hafiz, he has a couple of ECGs. Yeah, so I- have interest to all, I think it's better for Hafiz to show those because after my session, everybody will be so tired that it will be time to go. Okay, oh, oh, right. okay we will start right, with Chaudhary Hafizul Hassan, sir. It's easy. Definitely. Sir, you can share your screen. I like to Chaudhary see the Hassan. practical things from Hafiz, sir. Yeah. By the time he is sharing his screen, may I request Athar Ali, sir, to say a few words. Okay. Actually, uh, this is a... I, I am always confused about this chapter. But I, particularly ECGs of the septum, sometimes I suspect, then I go back, I, I see the reports, then again I see the ECG and then I comment. This is such type of septum. Many a times I did. I, 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 most of the time, sometimes I see this is a ECG of the hypercalibrium, but I'm not sure. Then, so from uh, actually Khaliku Zaman's lecture has given many of my, the questions of many of my, many, many answer to many of my questions. It was an Thank amazing, you, excellent lecture. Actually, uh, I have got uh, answers to many of my questions. Thank you, uh, Kaliko Zaman, for your excellent and brilliant yes, lecture. Thank you. And Mohammed Ali Firoz, actually, yes, you don't sir. forget to co uh, take some comments from the Kanish um, Fatima, actually, uh, who is very much, actually, he is uh, everyday practice about this issue, Kanish Fatima. And Dr. Kanish Fatima, you can make some comments about your experience with uh, in ICU regarding electrolyte imbalance and ECG, how much it is helpful for you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, actually, in our ICU, most of the time, uh, we hmm. face patients with hyperkalemia most of the time. And, uh, hello? Yes, we are okay. listening to you. Hyperkalemia uh, most of the time and uh, very few cases of um, hypercalcemia. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, here Atahardi sir and all other um, Madhu sir, Profit sir and other cardiologists who are uh, present here. Uh, as I work in the Bardem Hospital, we do not have a uh, pacemaker facility or cat lab uh, facility in our hospital. There is adjoining Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital. So, uh, what we face that in case of severe hypercalemia, patient usually present with uh, sometimes severe bradycardia. In that case, should we uh, start dialysis first? Wait, because uh, each session of dialysis takes four to six hours, sometimes eight hours in case in of slow sustained dialysis sleds. So should we wait uh, for that time or refer the patient with any other ICU with TPM facility. Dr. Rafiq, would you please answer this to this question? Hyperkalemia right. with bradyarrhythmia 
should we send the patient for yeah. pacemaker in or, our institute or, we do not have uh, medical facility for pacemaker sure okay. i mean two things probably so we have got the question so fix it this is a patient with renal failure you are talking about so there yes. is no quick way of decreasing so one of the thing that we can do first of all is the patient symptomatic uh, we have patients with heart rate of 30 doing fine when lying in bed. So we don't rush into putting anything. As soon as we collect the potassium, they'll be fine. If there is no time, and I'm sure not even in Bangladesh, even here we have problem. So what they do, they give calcium gluconate and insulin in the ear. That can reverse part of the effect and increase the heart rate. And in some cases, we do put a temporary pacemaker until everything resolves. But I think if a patient is heart rate 30, I know it is a little bit nerve wracking if the patient is not symptomatic. And the other choice, I know the Ibrahim Cardiac Center is very close by, but even in our hospital to transfer patient from one unit to another, it takes time. So I think having dialysis and lowering the potassium is the best thing to do. And the other thing, I don't know if you have it, uh, we always put transcutaneous pad on the chest, but that modality is, is not it doesn't always capture, that is the problem part, but at least uh, that is one thing that can be used. Most of the current defibrillators have a transcutaneous pacing, but uh, my rule of thumb is put the pad on, but don't use it because extremely, it is extremely painful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Uh, I uh, think actually, we, we can, can wait uh, at heart rate 45, but uh, if the heart rate is below 45, it's really, uh, as okay. we have mentioned now, breaking we, for okay. us. Okay, if you stay in my question answer session, uh, my session, we will have some interesting ECGs. We'll talk about it. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Uh, I think Professor Chaudhary Hafizul Hassan can uh, show his ECG now. So uh, this is a very um, not uncommon situation that we see this kind of uh, polymorphic. VT uh, and we had another board question uh, showing that uh, tracing uh, and uh, it was actually an artifact. So when when it, it happens, then you look at the patient that uh, one of the way that patient lost pulses, passed out, and then you evaluate the patient. And then uh, my question to you, what do you do then? That the patient doesn't have any pulse, passed out, and then um, what, what do you do then? But if the patient has pulses now, this episode then came back to sinus rhythm, blood pressure okay, little dizzy, but alert awake. What do you do then? Um, because this is something to talk about and then how we work this up. Any discussion? Sir, from the uh, next time you can arrange the pole, sir. From the next time. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but but any uh, anyone to jump on? Uh, may I request Abdullah Jamil, uh, Dr. Uh, sir, to discuss uh, the cool. Assalamu alaikum. I am sorry that I came a little late as I came out from the hospital late by one hour. So in this tracing, so, what I see, the upper two panels looks like torsor is the pointers. Uh, and in the lower two panel, uh, third one is uh, something artificial or something like that. But in the lower panel, it seems normal ECG with undulation of the baseline. So in this type of patient, I should look at the, the patient's face first, okay. whether there is any expression or not. Uh, and I will ask his name and whether he is feeling bad or anything else. If the patient is fine, and then the total thing is artificial and uh, nothing to be done. Okay, so let me tell you what happened to this patient. Uh, he's like mid 60s, I think, and then uh, a little bit of alcohol came and then lost uh, consciousness and lost pulse. They shot, and then they called us, and they, they as uh, uh, Professor Khalikud Jaman said, that you know, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. They gave, for torsad, they gave magnesium boluses and they looked at the uh, labs if there is any coexistent hypokalemia uh, and then, uh, then this EKG. So uh, I told them to do an EKG and we have uh, 
handle echo and uh, uh, see any regional wall motion and we brought the cat lab in and basically this was a very ischemic substrate uh, LAD ischemia in fact uh, that was treated and then it got better. So this, I wanted to mention one thing that hyperkalemia related as you saw in the EKG, we need to recognize this because we cannot take this or should not take this patient to the cat lab because it can be a disaster in the cat lab if we cannot recognize hyperkalemia related. STEMI is two part. It is the ST elevation part and the MI part. So clinical picture is very important. Is the clinical picture is consistent with MI or not? If the clinical picture is not consistent, then we should be thinking about the ST elevation differential. And there are a variety of reasons why the ST elevations can be high as we learned today, right? Hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, Brugada can give this picture. We can have persistent ST elevation from apical aneurysm. We can have LVH related hyper uh, uh, ST elevation. We can have early repole. We can have Osborne waves mimicking this. So some are real deal ST elevation. Some are like ST elevation mimics. And if we have the patient in front of us, it is very important that we evaluate the patient uh, with the clinical part and then come up with a diagnosis and do this. And if we have a handled echo, that comes handy, that, that helps us in terms of, is it a global LV dysfunction, regional wall motion, or the LV function is normal? Or in some cases, for example, in hypercalcemia, you may even see dehydration and hyperdynamic LV. Um, pericarditis can be confusing with the uh, ST elevation. And that can be another important thing to consider. So we all need to be very careful and, and, and transient ST elevation, of course, can be due to a spasm. So this is a, a case that I will show you. It came up just in New England Journal only a week ago or, or maybe this week. So this is a 54 year old uh, coming uh, following uh, ventricular fibrillation, resuscitated, and then uh, this was found in the EKG. This is a very, very interesting EKG. Uh, may I request sure. Professor Moshin Oshin? Can you make some com comments on this ECG? Professor Moshin Oshin? Sir, Firuz. Sir. sir, before commenting this ECG, I can, uh, can I ask a question, sir? Yeah. Sir, regarding your first ECG. Yeah. Uh, sir, that, is, that ECG was described by the Dr. Jamil. Sir, it will take time to get the lab report. Unless yeah. It Unless you get the lab report, we are not sure. If the patient only has got the shortness of the breath, no anginal chest pain like this, that is there are no symptoms suggestive of the acute coronary syndrome. No yeah. acute coronary syndrome, patient has got the shortness of the breath, this is the ECG. It will take time to get the lab report. So what I do, sir, at this time? So, uh, otherwise, the, the, this is actually a board question in internal medicine here. If the patient is not unconscious, or this is happening recurrent, the first thing they ask you is deep magnesium. Thanks, sir. Yeah. So I don't know, Rafik Bhai, do you have any comment? But if no, you can say unconscious, same. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, magnesium is something that will not harm the patient and actually yeah. has tremendous benefits. So I think infusion of magnesium is something that should be seriously considered while we are waiting for the labs. Yeah. It's been said that magnesium is a cardiac sedative. Yeah, well said. Well said. Um, so this EKG uh, was following the uh, following the uh, ventricular fibrillation, uh, and uh, and they said that there may be some ST elevation. I don't know. You can see my pointer. Yeah, so we can see. see. AVL is like uh, ST elevation, maybe. But importantly, and Ravik, but you can make a comment that there is, looks like a right bundle and then left bundle, uh, alternating, you know, uh, somewhat. Uh, mm. And then, and then because of the, you know, we, the plumbers, the interventional cardiologists, we are dumb. And he's the PF, so okay, take to the cath lab. Uh, and the patient was, uh, patient passed out, unconscious, so they did a CT. 
I'm not a neurologist, but the CT was negative, and the coronaries were, of course, normal, but the LB function was really bad, uh, and they put an impella. But look at this, forget about the impella part, but look at the SKG alternating. See that alternating? Yes. So, so uh, what does it remind you? Something alternating uh, bundle type? Does anything remind you? I tell you, I struggled with this case, uh, but I was thinking that this is like alternating bundle. Did, did the patient took any, uh, was on any digoxy, but he's a relatively young guy, had no cardiac history, was not on any, any medication. But it's kind of interesting, is it? Look at that, that how it is alternating, you know? So it turns out to be that his potassium was very low and very low, despite correction, remain low. Any, any spinal electron, uh, uh, that means aldestrin secreting tumor or hyperplasia, something like that. Okay, so uh, Professor Awadu Chaudhary has, as, as usual. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 you're uh, right, you're right. Let me tell you, as usual, you are, you are, you are yeah. pathophysiologically right on the money. Mm. The hyper aldosterone type. I would have asked his uh, hypertension history. Oh, no, no hypertension. So, so, so it is same, right? That the, there was a little bit of acidosis, but look at this. This is all hyper aldosterone excess, profound hypokalemia. You are absolutely right. So, aldosterone type, type thing in the body. So, is it digitalis with the sharing the same? Or is it high aldosterone with a secondary hypertension, cortisol spread, or glycoretinic acid? So this patient was taking excessive amount of uh, what they call is licorice. Um, mm. And the licorice has the same, and he was in protracted hypokalemia, giving this issue with the uh, uh, ventricular fibrillation. And then and this is the whole cartoon that NETM said like a public health safety now uh, and be aware. So I thought that it was relevant with Professor Khalikud Jaman's talk that high, how this metabolic problem can give you a big cardiac issues. Can you go back to the ECG, please? Yeah, sure. First one. Yeah, the first, the second, yeah. yeah this, this one. one. This one. Yeah, I mean, this one. to the, to the, no, no, please go back to the, to, to our audience. I mean, this ECG does not tell us that patient has hypokalemia. Yeah. Can you go back, please? Have go back on this. Yeah. Hey, this one. I mean, <laughs> I always tell people if you, why, why is it more? So another thing, uh, Rufik Bhai, uh, as you point, uh, saw in the presentation from Professor Can you Khalifa go back Jumla, on the ECG, please? Can you go back on the ECG? I have two, yeah, this one. No, 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 this one, this one. This one, yeah. oh, why this is one? it moving? No, yes, this one, okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, I'm staying I mean, I mean, if you look at this ECG, what, what will you think of it? Well, the thing, Rufik Bhai, uh, Rovik by Atar by, you guys think one way, me and Wadud, we think another way. Knowing ventricular fibrillation, I'm thinking, is there any ischemic substrate? Is there any ST elevation? No, and that is true. No, 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 that is, that is why the patient had the cardiac arrest. But if I look at this ECG, yeah. what, I mean, let's say you have given this ECG to a, uh, to a physician in Bogra. Yeah. What will he? What should he immediately think of this ECG? Yes, that's a good question. Good question. So I mean, he will make a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block. Bundle branch block. Exactly. That is the, that's exactly. one possibility. Second yeah. possibility, but, but I think about the FE. We have issues because yeah. these are actually P wave. Yeah. Yes, but Hafiz, you are looking at it retrospectively. Right. And carefully look at, but the question would be that if uh, anybody looking at it suddenly, 
will show the irregulated white keywords. Yes. yes. My problem is, my problem with this white keywords, this is a very ugly looking white keywords that we see in two conditions. One, when the patient is dying with agonal rhythm, right, sir. which the patient did, or severe hyperkalemia, right? Yes, sir. Exactly. Uh, but, that's okay, a, that's a confusing to, thing. I wanted to tell you another thing that Professor Khalikud Jaman also mentioned, and we see this uh, in the in the ER that when there is a severe acidosis and hyperkalemia, it mm. makes it even worse yeah. uh, with the acidosis, and therefore it is imperative to treat with bicarb when there is uh, hyperkalemia. Now, I think Hafiz Bhai. Yeah. Sir, actually, uh, really, it is a good message from Rufik sir to our participant that is such type of ugly looking ECC. Initially, by, from cardiac point of view, we think it is a serious ECC. But what I am actually uh, like to comment that is this ECC messes more with the hyperkalemia than the hypokalemia. Okay. Right. So, okay. and, and, and honestly, if you look at this, no one is, no one is disputing that. The reason when we see the EKG first and the clinical picture, we get fooled, right? That this is a metabolic yeah. problem or not. You do whatever you need to do and then think about this gap because look at this. Hey, it's a mass general. They also got fooled. They did the cap. They found cap normal. And then the, the, the correction of the acidosis and this, look at the QRS become narrow now. Yeah. When you see this QRS narrow, you don't view the differential of uh, hyperkalemia anymore. But what it does in the second panel, that it does give this alternating bundle type, if you look at this. Yeah. Hmm. And that that raises question, you know, bi bidirectional tachycardia, bidirectional in, in, in the context of ditch, we all know. Uh, but this was very mesmerizing in a way. I mean, that's the reason it went to NEGM. <laughs> but I thought that is interesting to bring up all the issues. Rufik Bhai mentioned a very key point that when the EKG is this ugly, then we need to think about the differential, not to jump on one thing. One thing. Yeah. Thank you. The Thank differential. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary Hafizul Hassan. I think we can move on to the next session. It yeah. would be the no session thinking. by Dr. Rofik Ahmed, sir. So we'll, have, uh, we'll do it half an hour today, right? Because okay, sir. Hour. Okay, so I have just like uh, before we'll do uh, present some ECGs and uh, you will uh, we, I have Shubra, given choices. Shubra, Paul is there. We can do the poll. Yes. So the attendees can start answering. Yes, sir. So we can start the poll. We can start the poll, sir. Yes. Yeah. I think 30 seconds is over. Uh, so 40% says it is uh, number two, that is sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia with left anterior fascicular block. And 44% says it is sinus bradycardia with left anterior fascicular block with hypocalcemia. And 20% says it is sinus rhythm with left axis deviation. Uh, okay, so we'll discuss this. Uh, okay, and Dr. Khaleku Jaman, right, uh, I want you to comment about this ECG amount, the choice of D. Do you agree or disagree with this? Uh, so this appears to be sinus bradycardia, left anterior hemi block, and somehow there is evidence of the left atrial enlargement. But the QT interval appears to be normal, within normal. Yeah, I put the QT interval below. 
It's 498, 498. correct? It's 415. So it is not short. Uh, yes, it's normal. There is yes, other, other the thing. Of reptilian enlargement and uh, QR is in the V1, V2, V3. It's a slight broadening of the QR is complex here. Yeah. Slight so, broadening. Is broadening. So, uh, people and there is persistence of the S wave in the V6 also. Yes. This is not usual findings. Yes. Probably this is lead position. Sometimes lead people position, put yeah. position in the wrong way. But the question is, Hypocalcemia, the ST segment should get long and QT should be long. It is not long. No, yes. It's not long. So I think the simple diagnosis is sinus bradycardia, left anterofacicular block. Just because today's lecture was electrolyte, I'm, I am sure if I get this ECG another day, everybody would have we'll answered number two. two number yes. two. Yeah. And that was the reason that I gave this ECG. So okay. please remember. Uh, should you comment on the P wave, sir? Yes, yes. The P wave is is a little funny looking P, P wave. If you if you if you go by the strict sense, it does not, not fulfill the criteria of sinus, sinus rhythm because these P waves are changing. Yes, sir. Over this this P wave in lead two and this one, and the, there's a changing P wave. And the, the rhythm strip, it is looks like bifid, sir. In the large large yes. strip. One of the things that happens is. We consider sinus node as one entity, but it's a long structure. It's a one-inch structure. And there can be wandering of the pacemaker within the sinus node. It can come from the top. It can come from the bottom and where is it? And that can give some variation. But for all the practical purposes, if somebody calls his sinus bradycardia left and anterior fascicular yes, block, exactly. I think that will be the primary diagnosis of this ECG. And we can go into nitty gritty of this. Now, next one. Um, So this, sir. We can start the poll right here. Yes, sir. We have started it. Uh, 30 seconds is over. We can show the result. So 86% uh, says it is junctional bradycardia with possible hyperkalemia. And 40% says it is junctional bradycardia with acute inferior myocardial infarction. Dr. Khaloko Jaiwan, congratulations. I think your, your lecture was excellent. Okay. Yeah. And that is the end result of this. So there are, I mean, when we give these choices, what are the rationale for this choice? There should be some relation. Sinus bradycardia with intraventricular. Anybody, any comment about this, uh, Dr. Khalaka Jaman? Can you say something about this? Uh, no, sir, I have no added comment because the T waves are very much prominent here. There is yes. uh, peaking of the T wave and there is no discernible P wave in the ECG and rate is very slow. And yes. There is junctional bradycardia mm -hmm. and possibility of hyperkalemia. Is there. Yes. But there is possibility there is lead to and ABF, there is a bit ST elevation, which may yes. be explained on only with hyperkalemia even, but there is one millimeter ST up in the lead two and ABF. Yes. So, so it you, brings us. Uh, sir, may I make a comment, sir? Yes. Uh, Dr. Khalikujan, uh, you have mentioned a term as sinoventricular rhythm. That means the impulse is generating from sinus, but there is no P wave. and uh, it is conducted in the QRS exactly. complex. Exactly. That may be a possibility. Is it a, is it a, is it a sinoventricular rhythm or junctional bradycardia? Maybe. Junctional, I have told that when the QRS complex is narrow or normal and there is absence of the POF, that may arise the confusion of the junctional rhythm. So junctional rhythm, differential diagnosis may be sinoventricular rhythm. We will consider the peaking of the POFs. So you may tell it's sinoventricular rhythm. Either. Okay. So what, so that I have a question for Dr. Kalako Jama. So there is a MD student taking final exam and his answer was junctional bradycardia with hyperkalemia. Will you let him pass? I'll be happy with only junctional bradycardia. And junctional bradycardia with hyperkalemia, yes. I'll yes. give him pass. So I actually had another ECG. I did not put it here today. 
and I looked at a rhythm like this and then magnified it. And sometimes you can see a very shallow P wave with first degree AV block. If you magnify sometimes, but this one I could not see anything. Um, so, and I put a diagnosis of acute inferior myocardium because in hyperkalemia we can get ST elevation. So, but we have to keep that in mind in the clinical context, like Hafiz mentioned, that patient is not having chest pain, so I don't have to rush this patient into the, into the cath lab. If this patient is not symptomatic, I don't have to put a temporary pacemaker in. I have to wait for the electrolyte. Other thing, what is a tall T wave? Tall T wave, one of the simple way I look at it, if it is more than the QRS complex, and if you look yes. at P4, look at this. The T wave is bigger than the QRS complex, and that is very much suggestive of hyperkalemia. If you look in V6, it doesn't look very big, but in V4 it is. So this is hyperkalemia. This patient's potassium was seven. Hey, and can I, sir, can I make a comment, sir? Yes, please do. Sorry, sir. Yes, the, sir. Inferior myocardial infarction definitely is a differential diagnosis, and uh, that is because of the some HTT changes in the lead two, three, and AVF. But actually, what you explained and what was in the Kalikozam uh, lecture, sir, actually, the HTT changes are also seen in the hyperkalemia. And in this disease, sir, there is a clear J point elevation and the Z wave in the lead three. That is the Z point elevation with this type of the concave ST segment elevation, I think. This is more coincides with the hyperkalemia than the acute myocardial infarction, along with your sir, suggestive symptom. Absolutely. This brings us to the point that patient is the most important thing. We have to go and talk to the patient. Are you having chest pain or not? Yeah. That's the issue. So this patient, when um, the potassium, uh, so these are the few findings that already narrow tall peak T wave, intraventricular conduction, decreased amplitude or absent P wave, ST segment change simulating injury. Yeah. Uh, so when the potassium goes down to five, you can see that in V4, uh, v is the T wave is much lower. And this is the ECG um, several days ago, normal ECG. Now I have another ECG now. This is a subject who is 36 year old female. And this is the, I have the rhythm stream. And what do you think? And this will bring to Dr. Kanis Fatima's uh, question. Um, uh, it will answer some, something about this. So 30 seconds is over. You can show the poll result. Okay. So it is a mixed result, sir. 37 person says it is D, that is sinus bradycardia, and take history and examine the subject. Uh, 32 person says it is A, sinus bradycardia with long QT interval, possible hyperkalemia. 21 person says it is sinus bradycardia, admit to ICU, insert temporary pacemaker, and 11 person says it is junctional bradycardia with IVCD. Okay. Any comment from the panelist? Sir, why there is no hypokalemia, sir? Is because we can see the E wave. Yes, e that's true. I, I did not give it by choice. So I'm glad that at least a significant number answered sinus bradycardia, take history and examine the subject. This yes. is an ECG from an elephant. It's an so Asian elephant. ST elevation and Q wave. Yes. Maybe. We, are, we are in electrolyte imbalance, but this thing, I think uh, that may sometimes be important in ischemia. That means inferior MI. In ABF, yes. we can look closely. There is Q wave and ST elevation along with Q wave. Yes. No question. So that, that's why the history is very important. Sinus they take history and examine the subject. This is an ECG from an elephant, not a human being. <laughs> it's an Asian elephant. Elephants have heart rate of 25, resting heart rate. And please imagine a 5,000 kilogram animal living on a heart rate of 25, and it is not passing out, and it does not need a temporary pacemaker. So the whole point is, is, is the importance of the symptoms. So I'm going to bring another ECG. 
The next is by who put the electrodes on the elephant. Oh yes. So I'll show, tell you exactly. I'll I'll bring it. So look at this. This is another ECG. This is a heart rate of eight. This subject is awake and hunting. This uh, is a whale. It is a blue whale. Blue it's whale. Yeah. Blue whale with a heart rate of eight. So this is another ECG, but this is a this subject is at rest, heart rate of 204. This is a four-year-old female. It is a hummingbird, which is two-year-old hummingbird, whose uh, equivalent human age should be 40. And this is the hummingbird. The body weight is three gram, heart rate of 204. So he doesn't need defibrillation. And this is what happens to whale. The whale, blue whale, when it stays at the surface, the heart rate is 35 to 30. As it dip, dives down to hunt, <coughs> its heart rate goes as low as four beats per minute. The reason I'm showing this is it's interesting that people do so much research and how do they do this? And this, look at the size comparison. A, a blue whale is 180,000 kilogram, and elephant is 50 kilogram, and human being is 70 kilogram. This is a huge weight. How do they do it? For, for, uh, for whales, they have suction cup and they put the electrode in the belly and they have transmitter which sends the signal and people recorded them. For the elephant, they have sutured, um, elect sutured electrode on the skin. I mean, so the, the whole point is that, that, that the heart rate is, is just a factor. And you know tennis player Bjorn Borg. Yeah. Bjorn Borg, he was the best tennis player in the world, and his heart rate, resting heart rate, was San his body cardiac rate 38 beats per minute. Oh. After playing six set of tennis, his heart rate will go to 78, 80. And he did not need a pacemaker. So please remember it, that the heart rate per se is not the most important factor. It is what? Uh, Symptoms. Okay, so now. Can I uh, make a point uh, yes. about the about the temporary wear? Yes. Electrolyte imbalance. Sometimes we see that we buy time with the, and I'm not for a second advocating this, but transcutaneous space and and immediately correct the electrolytes before you arrange the trans in a spacer. The rhythm is already better. Exactly. No question about it. Absolutely right. So the answer for this is, is, is sir, 62% uh, says it is D, that is sinus rhythm in complete right bundle bounce block, long QT and possible hypocalcemia. Oh, fantastic. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Khalikud Jaman. Uh, I have got the same opinion. Yeah. Good. So your lecture works. <laughs> <laughs> so with me. So this patient, uh, this patient's uh, calcium level was 7. I usually put it in Japanese so that you don't understand what it is. Uh, and normal in our hospital was 8.5 to 10.2. And you can see here, if you look at this QT interval, let's say V5, the ST segment is long, that E wave did not change much. If you look at long QT syndrome, the T wave will become wide. So the T, that's why you look at to see if there's any difference. And all of this, when I'm reporting this ECG, I will say suspect hypocalcemia. And I'll uh, look up the report of this patient. Excellent, sir. That means you are saying, sir, in case of congenital long QT syndrome, the T yes. wave, uh, along with the ST segment, uh, long ST segment, the Q, T wave will be changed. But in case of electrolyte disturbance like hypocalcemia, Basically, the T wave remains unchanged, but the STC will get prolonged. Exactly. Right, right. So long QT with the, the prolongation, there is one type of long QT where there is ST prolongation, but majority there is wide T wave. Sir, also, you have got Osborne if wave there, J wave, in that ECG. Previous one. Yeah. Osborne. Yes. 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 
Thirty-two percent says it is a accelerated junction rhythm, prominent U wave, possible hyper hyperkalemia. Thirty-two percent says it is sinus rhythm with prominent U wave, possible hypokalemia. And twenty-six percent says it is sinus rhythm, first degree AV block. Eleven percent says it is complete heart block. Okay. Any other panelists have any comment about it? Why is Monwar today? I missed him. <laughs> Bishkatha, do you want to comment? Uh, to me, it appears first degree heart block. Uh. Anybody? So, let me. Sir, if. Go ahead. At, 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 sir, please. Sir, is there any points in favor of the junctional rhythm, sir? Well, if I don't see, if this is a U wave, yes. this is a junctional rhythm. So, yes, right. I mean, if I look at, let's look at V V five. It looks like E wave, right? Right. Yes, and then there is no P wave preceding the QRS, so that should be a junction rhythm. But what doesn't? I mean, if I look at lead two, I cannot tell why there is a P or U. But in lead V one, it's biphasic. a little funny looking. It looks kind of biphasic, yeah. almost like sinus P wave. So in this case, I mean, I can imagine, I will call it sinus rhythm, but I will also look at other ECGs on this patient. And so what happens, this rate was 78, and when it goes down to 71, you can see the P wave much better now. Yeah. See? So, and this patient actually had another ECG with a heart rate of 101. It is almost impossible because this patient had baseline first degree heart block. And the reason I'm showing it is when there is first degree AV block and the rate gets fast, it looks like E wave. Sometimes it can look like SVT because I cannot see the P wave. So follow up ECG is very important on this patient. Thank you. So and generally, you, generally U waves are more prominent in the mid precordial lead. Yeah, and yeah, when sure. this this dominance and prominence is not present, and we have a differential diagnosis of. Uh, first degree heart block, then should, we should go towards first degree heart block. Great. Yes, thank you. Uh, and another thing is that the e wave is generally not sharp or peaked. Yet the uh, waves are actually peaked. And one thing Rafikisar has always or, or, always emphasized this. If you want to be sure it's a sinus, look at lead two, lead one, whether it is upright, the wave which we presume to be sinus wave, whether it is upright or not. Second, look at V1 whether it is biphasic or not. If a biphasic web is there and this is upright in lead one, two, you can be sure the most likely it's a P web, sinus P web. Okay. We have two more ECGs, then we'll finish on time. Okay, this one. Um, sorry, this one, this. And I, there is a computer generated report uh, to help you also. <laughs> or confuse you either way. Thirty seconds. You can show the result. That forty four percent says it is twist to one AV block with right bundle branch block. And 33% says it is complete heart block. 22% says it is sinus bradycardia with first degree AV block with RBB. Any any comment from any of our panelists? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Jalfai, do you want to comment? Mm, I'll go with uh, the answer C. C. No comment. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, let's give uh, analysis. The, the people who said first degree AB block, uh, in their defense, I have first degree AB block, I can see a P wave, P wave QRS, P wave QRS. So, in their defense, it is, and P wave looks pretty good. However, if I go this way, I can see that the PR is changing. Yes. yes. So that's one. But then again, you can say, well, there can be some very, very little PR. Idioventricular rhythm, uh, because it's a white QRS, but it, it fulfills the right bundle morphology. Now, two to one heart block is a possibility. If that's the case, then this is a P wave. There should be another P wave. And I kept looking at it, and then I found it something here. If you can see my pointer, there's a P wave, there is a P wave, there is a P wave, there is a P wave. So then my confusion was, it's two to one hard block, but then there is a variability. So what I did, I did the timing of this. If I do the timing, the RR interval is 1,600 milliseconds, exactly 1,600 milliseconds. And then if I put that this initial P wave, the P2P is 1600 milliseconds. First two. However, if you look here, 1630, 1640, 1650. So there it, this RR did not match this P2P interval. And I felt like that this was complete hardball. Um, but one can always argue that there is delayed conduction. If that was true, then this RR should have been longer when the RR, when the, this interval, PR is getting shorter. It does not affect the RR interval at all. So I felt like that this is complete hard block. Um, and if we do longer rhythm, we could have seen the clear every dissociation um, on this patient. Just and the then, then you can see the put the P waves and I put the timers here. So interesting thing, look at this. P to P interval changes a little bit. If you look at this P interval that is including the QRS complex, is a little shorter than the one that is not enclosing it. It's called ventriloquistic sinus arrhythmia, that this QRS complex brings the next P a little early because it is 1640 and this is a little longer. So that is not uncommon to see uh, in in this kind of ECG. How about this one? Oh, I didn't put choice. I didn't put any choice. The question was that what it is. And the report was that it was sinus bradycardia with premature actual contraction. And the point was P wave QRS complex, P wave QRS complex, P wave QRS, Ignore this one, but there is a premature beat. So the report came up as premature atrial complex, non-specific interventricular conduction delay. I think because of the, I think this is probably lead position, but it looks like left bundle. However, if I put the timing, this RR interval is 15, 20 milliseconds, exactly 15, 20, but this one is early. And then it becomes 15, 20. And if you look at the P2P interval 760, 760 plus 820, that makes um, 1580. So that the P2P is not matching with R to R. And I think this is a conducted beat. So this is what we call high grade AV block. Um, I know uh, Jamal has any comment on this? Jamal. Uh. What do you think? Uh, uh, I agree with you. So this is a high grade AV block. Uh, what is, this is the question, Jamil, we get all the time. What is definition of high grade? I mean, we have first degree AV block, second degree AV block, right? Sir. And then Sir. third degree. But what? why Why are we using this term called high grade AV block? I mean, we uh, use it all the time. We use as because in the same patient, sometimes it looks like a complete heart block, sometimes two to one. Sometimes uh, they show uh, some bits are conducted, most of the bits are blocked. 
confusing. That's why we use a common term high grade heavy block. Yeah, but very what, very what I understand, sir, what yeah. I understand, sir, the, as Javil Bhai has said, the, in case of complete heart block, no P are conducted into ventricles. Yeah. The ventricular yeah. P goes on their own way. But in case of high grade heavy block, some of the P's are con conducted. Most of them are not, but not in a fixed pattern. That's the problem. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, for the audience, that if it is, it looks like complete heart block, but just like this case, we think that this is a conducted QRS complex, then we are calling it high grade AV block. In, in clinical purpose, in all clinical purpose, this patient should be treated as complete heart block. Complete Please heart remember. Block. Yeah. If this patient comes to the hospital without any symptom, we don't necessarily have to put a temporary pacemaker in. We don't do that um, here. Uh, if this patient came with syncope and there is no other reversible cause, we try to put the permanent pacemaker as quickly as possible. Adding a temporary pacemaker um, adds to the complication. Um, uh, another, another procedure for the patient, it increases the risk of infection. So that's it. I think this is the last ECG. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I like to add something. Today I did one uh, dual chamber pacemaker in a lady, uh, aged uh, 50, 50, 50 years old. She was having uh, this kind of uh, high grade AV block, and she uh, had even pulmonary edema also. So she has uh, no history of syncope, but she had features of uh, uh, pulmonary edema and. Uh, on exertion, she is very tired. So I put uh, her uh, a permanent pacemaker today. Yeah. So one of the thing about permanent pacemaker. So one of the thing that happens. This patient has left bundle bind block. And so when you put the ventricular lead, you have to be very very careful if there is no temporary pacemaker. Because. You go with the ventricular lead and you touch the right ventricle, right bundle, and you can develop complete heart block. Yes. I mean, there will be no escape bit at all. Yeah. And if that happens, what I do is I use that first lead active as a temporary. So I go with the lead quickly, anchor it, and then use the second lead for the ventricular pacing. And the first lead, if it is active lead, I use it in the atrium. So that's the trick to use. Um, I just to avoid temporary pacemaker. We don't. We we rarely put temporary pacemaker for uh, before permanent pacemaker implant. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Fikram, sir. Uh, I think we are at the end of our session. Now we I can request. Uh, may I request Professor Amatara Alistair to show the ECG of the week. Ribu, can you share your slide, please? Yes, sir. I'm sharing, sir. Dr. Kanish Fatima, have we answered your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. There is, you, there is one more concern about me? pacing in patients with a hyperkalemia. It, 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 it is difficult to pace in, but it does not pace with hyperkalemia. Ribu, show the issue. Yes, yes sir. Uh, Ribu, can you sir, go for I'm the sure. next, yes, next sir. one? Yes, you are visible. Go for the next one. Next slide. Yes, sir. Uh, one second, sir. Yes. Sir, Rupi, yes. Sir, 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 this issue was posted in the Facebook. Uh, me and uh, Abdullah Chaudhary have seen it, and its answer was given by our Dr. Abdullah Jamil. So, we Will have I got the answer. But before that, uh, we want to share the answer, and finally, we want to have some comments from Rupi, sir. What do I? The interpretation, please. Yeah, Rupi, the next one. Yes, here it is. What is my please interpretation? Uh, we see that general impression is there is a supraventricular rhythm, rapid rhythm, relatively narrow complex. Rate is 150 uh, BPM, and we call it there is SVT, then sinus again SVT, QS is normal, hypertrophy is there, LVH criteria fulfilled. The ST2 changes not there. Now look at the ECG. 
Uh, go back to the ECG again. Ribu, yes, go sir. back to the ECG. Yes, yes, sir. You have to be sharp. We will be going back and uh, to, to the answer again. Sir, the internet is very slow, sir. One second, sir. Yes, now look at this. The initial part, narrow complex, rapid, no P wave. Then again, there is a pause, then there is a typical sinus rhythm. It's going on for one, two, three, three beats. Again, there starts a premature beat. Again, it starts a uh, rapid rhythm. Now look at V1. The first one, P Q R S T, second one P Q R S T, third one P Q R S T, fourth one, look at the second hump of the Q R S complex. That hump, R S R prime like feature is not present in the first three Q R S complexes. And among these three, the third Q R S complex is early. Probably that has started this tachycardia. Now go back to the answer. Yes, sir. Atrial flutter is a possibility, but uh, this Nero this uh, taking a nerve complex starts by a uh, premature bit, and no P we have seen. Pseudo are in V1, as I have seen the second hump we have seen. So most likely diagnosis is AVNRT. That's the answer provided by Dr. Abdul Al Jamil Bhai. In the first first part of the ECG, go back uh, to the ECG. Uh, one can look at the the uh, first tachycardia, the last bit. Uh, that yeah. is the eighth bit of the first uh, part. It looks li little bit different yeah. than the other complexes, and uh, also uh, on timing. So it uh, seems that this one is was an another ectopic bit which terminated the uh, SVT. And again, another bit in the second half, uh, last half, uh, what uh, Dr. Wadud explained, then another exit bit again restarted the technical Sir, can you call me, Professor? I have a little problem with APN. How old is the patient? Sir, 50. 50. So, one of the things that look at, in V1, there is a P wave here, right? And then there is a P wave here. And then QRS complex. And I was wondering that if this sharp point of the P wave, T wave is the P wave. And why am I thinking that way is because if you look at lead V6, this part, maybe this is a distortion, but over here, there is some distortion over here. So I am Sir, thinking- Sir, you have to mention the beat name because we cannot see the cursor. Oh, so in lead V1, uh, V1 and num, oh yeah, that's true. You cannot see my cursor. So yeah. lead V1, um, the first beat, second beat, third beat looks like sign of the fourth beat on the T is wave different. Different. is different. So I am wondering, if there is a possibility that this is an actual tachycardia. Uh, yeah. If it is not actual tachycardia, then my con my cons my problem is how did it initiate? Who who started the tachycardia? Is it the third bit or is it the fourth bit? If the fourth mm. bit started the tachycardia, then it looks like an actual tachycardia. There is no PR problem. Here. Or it's an atypical epinodal oriented tachycardia. Uh, because, and now it is true that you can see this R prime in lead B1. Um, so, but if we look at lead, these are not simultaneously. So, I mean, R prime. I know where, where you are getting it from, that R prime is making it uh, the possibility. But I think if you look at lead V2, 
there is some change in the T wave, which probably is the P wave. So it is either a typical epinode reentry versus actual tachycardia. I mean, if it were an older person, I would have thought of um, more of actual tachycardia, but we have seen younger patients with actual tachycardia. So, I mean, these are all differential diagnoses, epinode reentry uh, plus um, actual tachycardia, and then the EP study, of course, is necessary. I mean, please let me know. Are you going to study this patient? Yes, sir. Uh, but, uh, he's in the list, but we have not yet studied, sir. We, we don't know the final diagnosis, sir. Okay, sir, but can you keep us posted? Once you do the study, can you bring this back and let me know what it is? Sir, I will can you keep... I will sir, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sir, can I ask you a question? Let's say this patient has COPD and he, she, she is 60 years old. Yeah. What would be the more possibility of atrial tachycardia, isn't it? Um, COPD, atrial tachycardia. I mean, it has to be severe COPD, and you see more multifocal atrial tachycardia than this kind of atrial tachycardia. So this tachycardia can happen in a regular basis. This is a very regular tachycardia, unlike that what we normally see with bad COPD patients. Sir, uh, sir. This patient has low voltage, isn't it? So there is a possibility of COPD. Sir, actually, what confused us, sir, that in V1, actually, uh, what seems to be the P point, sir, in case of the V1, if this is the V1, this is strong point in favor of the atrial take area. But, sir, look at the sir, this V, that is the P, what is we call the P, that is in V1, that is concerts with the T in case of the V6. Yes. So this is the reason actually we did not think, yes sir, this is definitely can be a, a, a P wave, but we thought that sir, this, this could be the T wave. Yes. And no, no, no question about it. I mean, that's the, pro that's the problem part with the CCG. But if you look at the T wave of the second QRS in V V1 and the T wave one before the last QRS, it looks as if it is distorted in a way looking like a P wave. That's so that's the and, only and the thing is that so the tachycardia rate is around 150. Actual flutter will not fit in. I'll tell you why. Because if it is actual flutter, the second P wave, the timing mm. may not be mm. right. And uh, it is not exactly, what is it 150? No, sir. It's no. a bit more. Exactly. A little bit more than 150. And there is a little warm up. There's a little warm up of the tachycardia because initially the RR is longer. The warm up actually supports actual tachycardia more than. Um, mm. Even entry. Sir, right. sir, if you don't mind, can I say something, sir? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sir, if you look at V3, lead V3 or V4, sir, and the, uh, since the second complex, the third one, the ongoing the third one and uh, continuing that, there is PR prolongation, which we find in 80. If we, yes. if we follow, sir, there are some PR prolongation. Yes. So my, it, my yeah, exactly. So goes my, more in favor of AT. Yeah. My first diagnosis is atrial tachycardia. Second is atypical avinodry. But I will buy any other diagnosis. I mean, so this is, look at this. I'm, I'm talking to the audience now, um, younger participants, that here we are uh, pretty senior physicians. Um, we, we are discussing this, the options, possibilities, and that is what medicine is all about. Yeah. We have to treat it like a, a, a supraventricular tachycardia, but the underlying cause that has to be identified, and these are the cases that should be referred to EP specialists. Okay, sir. I'll do the EP study and let you know the answer, sir. Yes, but please remember one thing. If you do electrophysiology study, and you find dual avenodal physiology, but cannot induce SVT, I will not do ablation. Because there is a possibility 
sometimes if people have recurrent SVT and we see dual avenodal physiology, even if we cannot induce SVT, sometimes we do avenod modification. But in this case, I will not do it unless I can prove that I have inducible avenodal reentrant tachycardia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. I think we are almost at the end of this session. Uh, Atar, sir, you have got some final comments. Well, guys, uh, really, this was a wonderful yeah. session, and uh, we must congratulate Dr. Khalegu Zaman. Yes. It was really memorable and wonderful lecture, particularly uh, on these uh, complex topics. And again, we must congratulate and welcome Dr. Hafizul Hassan. He's not uh, in the screen possibly, but uh, it was a uh, really a good experience and we always want to share some experience with Dr. Hafizul Hassan. We want to ensure that he will be in our all lecture sir. If he's got time, I uh, request uh, Rufi Kamen sir to actually say our invitation to Hafizul Hassan sir to, I mean, if it's possible, say, I mean, we want that he will be in every lecture and like he will share the ECGs like you sir. Actually, Rafik sir insisted that I invite him. Yeah, I will be a good academician. Yes, sir. And uh, finally, uh, also, uh, Rupi Kamen said this was the, actually, this is the glory and glamour of this session, that is Rupik sir's session. And finally, our all our other panelists, Dr. Zamil, uh, Meshka Tahmed Bhai, and possibly there are also uh, our other uh, faculty, senior faculties. I cannot see in the screen, but while even the present in the screen, actually we must congratulate everybody. And finally, it is a Begzimco. We are actually uh, uh, giving us a tremendous support to make our program successful. Begzimco, Rifu and uh, Shubdo. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you everybody. Next day. Thank you, everybody. The next day, sir, the program will be on the Saturday. Next, next sir, session. Yes. sir, next, next day, from Nepal, Orun will be presenting a case. I think he will follow up with some investigation. He is waiting for that. Yeah. Orun, would you make a comment? Yeah, I mean, uh, last time uh, we had a case, 71 years old gentleman. He was referred as a bradycardia. Heart rate was around 30, 34. Or do that not that divulge too much. Keep, yeah. keep no, it uh, no, that's right. mystery. <laughs> keep yeah. it a secret. Yeah. He was a uh, <laughs> past history of uh, dizziness, but no syncope. So I'll send, uh, uh, what is the, can you send me uh, Rafiq's WhatsApp? So I'll yeah. send all those data so he can. I, I, will, I, will, send. I, will, send. I will send. I will send the email. It is better on the email, then I can easily modify those. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I will send it, sir. Sir, our next program is Saturday, 8.30, and our... Uh, 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 can we make it 9 from uh, next month? Okay, if everybody agrees, then, sir, Rupi, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. It, I'm fine. It, it, it is helpful for many of us. Right, okay. Ribu? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. 9 to 11. Nine next day, sir, Rupi, sir, now? Yes, sir. Yes. Ah. Okay. All right. Next lecture, sir. White complex take. White complex take. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank so you, nine, sir. 9 p.m. Ribu. You please ask everybody. Know. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. No, sir. Sound. I will change accordingly. Thank you, sir. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum.